Ethiopia is a unique state in the African context. It has existed in a coherent form for more than two millennia, fighting off numerous foreign invasions. It has its own alphabet, a self-defined concept of nationhood, and it largely escaped European colonization. All this and more make the country stand out in the continent. Now, Addis Ababa is working on political, economic and foreign policy reforms aimed at redefining Ethiopia as a regional powerhouse. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Before we continue, I want to recommend you to check out the YouTube channel Terra Matter. They create valuable content on nature, conservation and the environment. It's a different side to geopolitics and their videos are well researched while their footage is outstanding. I particularly enjoyed the video on the Nile conflict or how container ships kill thousands of whales. Have a look on their channel for more. When we think of geopolitical competition in East Africa, the usual candidates are China, Russia, Turkey, Iran, various European powers, a few Arab states and the United States. Absent from this list are the nations from within the area itself. That notion is steadily changing. Ethiopia is applying reforms that seek to transform the country's internal and external mechanisms. A clear sign that the state wants to increase its influence in the periphery and Ethiopia is distinctly situated to take on such a role. What sets the country apart is that Ethiopia is gifted with a substantial amount of freshwater resources. A dozen major rivers snake through its territory, with the largest delivering into the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. Meanwhile, the smaller rivers and lakes feed into the lowlands and coalesce into three critical hydrological basin systems. The first and largest is the Nile Basin, which includes the Blue Nile, Akobo and Tekeza rivers. Together they cover roughly a third of Ethiopia and then flow west to the White Nile in Sudan and South Sudan. The second basin is located in the Rift Valley and includes the Awash, Omo, Lake Turkana and their tributaries. The basin covers about a quarter of Ethiopia and goes straight through the center of the country before it dissipates into the plains of Djibouti and Kenya. The third basin is the Shabali Juba to the southeast. It includes the Shabali and the Genali rivers and the basin covers a third of the country and then extends into Somalia until it drains into the Indian Ocean. There are many more rivers, lakes and even basins, but these three watershed systems are the most critical ones. What these basins have in common is that much of the water is generated in the Ethiopian mountains and highlands and then flows to the lower riparian nations like Kenya, Djibouti, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia and even as far as Egypt. This makes Ethiopia an indispensable source for renewable surface fresh water, generating as much as 123 billion cubic meters annually. Each of the downstream nations relies on access to the fresh water flowing out from Ethiopia and this grants Addis Ababa political leverage across East Africa. Historically, the allocation of fresh water to the lower riparian nations was an academic issue because Addis Ababa did not possess the means to shape nature. That has fundamentally changed. In less than two decades, hydroelectricity has become the primary method of power generation in Ethiopia as the state began constructing power plants, dams and stations along its rivers. As of 2016, the installed electricity capacity in the country sits at a modest 4200 megawatts, of which 90% is from hydropower. However, Addis Ababa has ambitious plans for the future. It is estimated that the country's hydropower potential is at least 45,000 megawatts. Let that sink in for a moment, because that is the second highest rate in Africa. Of course, not all of the potential will be fulfilled, but it goes to show that Ethiopia is only getting started with its hydropower developments. 
Some of the projects, however, have already caused considerable controversy, such as the massive Gigal Gibei 3 dam located on the Omo River. Commissioned in December 2016, the Gigal Gibei 3 is one of three dams along the Omo and its tributaries that drain upstream water to irrigate large plantations on the Ethiopian side of the border. While doing so, however, it deprives Lake Turkana of its precious water, which is situated some 675 kilometers downstream in Kenya. In the coming years, as the water level in Lake Turkana drops, Kenyan plains, villages, livestock and fisheries will be affected severely. An even more controversial project is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and its power stations along the Blue Nile River. It's the biggest hydroelectric dam in Africa and once it's operational, it will generate over 6400 megawatts of power. However, the dam will also have direct consequences for downstream Egypt, as such, the mega project marks a source of friction between Cairo and Addis Ababa. We did a separate report on this project a few years back, so check that out for more details. The point is that Ethiopia has enormous hydropower potential and the government has set its sights on an additional 17 places for hydropower projects. So Ethiopia's controversial hydropower policy has thus far set a pattern of behavior for the foreseeable future. Now, if you want to explore this map on your own, you can. I've created a special page with an interactive globe that displays rivers, lakes, basins, ethnicities, etc. It's pretty neat and it's available for those who join our Patreon community or the YouTube membership program. In any case, with a history of regional supremacy and in control of water resources, Ethiopia is bound to make its mark in the 21st century. However, before the country can throw its weight around, it needs to get its house in order. And Ethiopia has its fair shares of troubles, from literacy, electricity, locusts to power dynamics, but standing out is the country's landlocked nature and its ethnic makeup. Ever since the loss of its coastal territory in Eritrea, Ethiopia has been stripped of its access to the sea. Being landlocked has raised the costs of imports and exports and today Ethiopia relies on neighboring Djibouti for 95% of its trade. This is a huge vulnerability, considering that Djibouti is also a military hub that hosts the navies of China, France, Italy, Japan and the United States. Right now, Ethiopia and Djibouti enjoy friendly relations, but that dynamic could easily be exploited by foreign powers and turned into a liability. To mitigate this vulnerability, Ethiopia is trying to expand its supply chain by gaining control of ports along the coast of the Horn of Africa. It's also considering developing a navy of its own somewhere in the future. But perhaps an even greater vulnerability is the country's ethnic layout. Spread interchangeably across the Ethiopian landscape are numerous ethno-religious groups, all native to the area. With a population of 109 million and growing, Ethiopia is dominated by two religions, Islam and Christianity. Its adherents can be further dissected into 80 ethnic groups, the largest of which are the Oromo, who account for roughly 32% of the population. The Amhara are the second largest, making up 28% of Ethiopians, while the Tigrayans and Somalis each represent another 6.5% of the population. And there are another 9 ethnic groups that have over a million members. Ethiopia's rugged terrain and its large territorial size makes it exceedingly difficult for the government to exercise its control over the entirety of the population, not to mention the hinterlands. As such, ethnic insurgencies have been a near constant occurrence throughout Ethiopian history and the central government used sheer might to cast its authority. In 1987, that paradigm changed as the communist dictatorship was abolished and in its place an ethnic-based federal system of governance was established. Then in 1994 the government took on a new constitution and divided its territories into nine regions and two autonomous cities 
based on the ethno-linguistic makeup of the local population. The trouble with this federal system is that it leaves out the ethnic minorities who don't belong to the dominant regional group. So there are a lot of grievances at the local level and the road towards federalism has been bumpy. However, in 2016, the stalemate was overturned when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed took office and started renewed efforts to form an inclusive central government. Abiy is a new kind of leader. He's young, he's a member of the Omoro community, he has both a Muslim and Christian background, and he is a former military officer. These qualities have thus far taken a shine to the rebel groups and dissidents, and the political environment is looking more stable today than it has in recent years. Under the leadership of Abiy, the state is trying to design a sense of unity and shared identity that supersedes ethnic fault lines. A concept commonly referred to as Ethiopia Vinet. If the social program works, the government will be empowered to act more decisively and independently in foreign pursuits. One thing all Ethiopians have in common is their shared heritage of resisting and repelling foreign invasions. It's a source of great pride and the government uses that history to motivate its public to work towards common goals. On the economic front, Ethiopia is not doing so well. As a result of the pre abiy unrest, there is a heavy dependency on imports, the national currency is declining in value, and the state is drowning in debt while facing liquidity problems. To rectify its economy, the government wants to stimulate double-digit growth by fully or partially privatizing public enterprises such as national airlines, telecommunications, logistics centers, railway projects, industrial parks, and so on. Ethiopian policymakers have also been trying to secure their national borders by improving relations with their neighbors. Secure borders would allow the state to transfer resources elsewhere and boost economic development, but in a region plagued by instability that hasn't been easy. There is conflict in Somalia and South Sudan with some of the violence spilling over into Ethiopian territory. Still, in recent years, Addis Ababa has taken the necessary measures to secure its borders. Eritrea and Ethiopia are in the process of mending ties, and if the settlement is fruitful, it will boost investor confidence in Ethiopia and give the country access to Eritrean ports. Even relations with Somalia have been favorable of late. Policymakers from both countries have expressed interest in economic integration and security cooperation. A secure and stable Somalia will allow Ethiopia to invest in the Ogadan region, construct pipelines across the area, and even acquire access to Somali ports. Meanwhile, in South Sudan, Ethiopia acts as a peace broker. In 2013, Addis Ababa negotiated a ceasefire deal in the South Sudanese civil war. Although that deal fell apart soon after, Ethiopian lawmakers are currently working on ways to turn that ceasefire into a lasting peace. There are about half a million South Sudanese refugees in Ethiopia, so the state has a lot riding on this. All these activities combined developing a shared identity, privatizing the economy, gaining access to ports, holding peace talks, etc. They indicate that Ethiopia is laying the groundwork to compete with foreign powers that are increasingly active in the Horn of Africa. And although Addis Ababa still has a long way to go, geography and history show that Ethiopia is uniquely suited to step up as a regional powerhouse. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. If you like this report, leave a like, comment and subscribe for the algorithm. Thank you for watching and Saul.